Hi, good morning everybody and welcome to this view on Africa at the Institute for Security Studies. My name is Simon Allison. I am the Africa editor for the Mail and Guardian newspaper. And I have just come back from a reporting trip to the little East African country of Djibouti. Um, it was a fascinating experience and, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, my talk is going to focus really on the extraordinary concentration of military powers that are in this little country. Um, it's also going to look at what makes Djibouti so attractive to those military powers, but more importantly, it's going to outline the four key threats to that attractiveness. Um, is Djibouti going to be less attractive to military powers in the future? Maybe. Let me start by setting the scene. In um, seven years as an Africa correspondent, Djibouti is one of the strangest places that I've ever reported from. Um, as I said, it's a very small country. It's on the Horn of Africa. It's home to less than a million people. And it really is extraordinarily inhospitable. Um, most of it is desert, very arid, very dry. Um, it has a couple of beautiful lakes, but those lakes are salty. So they're not, they're, those are not useful for irrigation um, or, or drinking. Economically, there's not much agriculture. There are very few natural resources. In fact, salt from those lakes is one of its main exports. And um, it doesn't have a lot going for it, except for one thing, its location. Um, located on the Red Sea, on a very strategic trade, trade route where most of the world's shipping has to pass through at one stage or another, um, that is really what Djibouti has got going for it. And that has made it a really interesting place for global superpowers who see in it um, a lot of geostrategic importance. How that manifests on the ground in Djibouti itself is in a very unusual, a little bit weird juxtaposition of normal civilian life and pretty intense military hardware. Um, the weirdness begins as you fly into the Mbouli International Airport in Djibouti City, the capital. On one side of the runway, there is a little commercial terminal um, with a little Djiboutian flag flying above it. Um, there are a few commercial planes on the apron. On the other side of the terminal, there are massive French and American military bases. And you can really see how um, this presence there in, types of, in terms of the, the types of planes um, that are on the apron. You've got military transports, you've got helicopters. Um, every now and then there, there's an occasional drone. Um, incidentally, the American flag that flies above its base at Camp Le Monnier, um, at the airport is about three times larger than the Djiboutian flag on the other side of the runway. Now Japan also has a presence um, at that airport and Italy has a, a base very nearby. Now the strangeness continues when you go into Djibouti city itself. I went one night, one, one evening, um, one Sunday evening, I went for a walk along the promenade, which lines the port of Djibouti. Um, it's a beautiful bit of town. You can, you can look at the, as the sun sets over the Indian Ocean, and you can see the ships coming and going. Um, the port of Djibouti has a, a long and interesting history. It's more than 100 years old. It was built by the French um, when it was the colonial power in this area. And the reason that it was built was as the terminus for a railway connecting Addis Ababa in Ethiopia with Djibouti because then, as now, uh, Ethiopia was landlocked and needed some kind of access to the port. Um, today the port um, is not as, you know, it has been modernized but it's, it's not used as much as it used to be. Um, it's not as modern as it could be and, you know, you can see the lines of, of, of trucks coming to collect the cargo. When I was there, I saw this, um, there we go, I saw this, this ship um, tied up at the harbor. Now this is a Chinese freighter. It is called the Jijiga, um, which is a city in eastern Ethiopia. Um, incidentally, I have been to Jijiga and it is a thoroughly unremarkable city and I'm not sure why anyone would call a ship after it. Anyways, this ship is bringing goods from China um, to Ethiopia to meet the rising uh, consumer demand from Ethiopia. I saw it leave a day or two later and it was nearly empty. Um, so there I am strolling along this promenade in Djibouti, um, contemplating the complexities of international trade, 
when suddenly I look up again and another ship appears on the horizon. There we go, I think you can see it. Um, so there's, there's the Jajiga and then next to it is a massive warship. Um, this is the Tonnerre. It is a French warship, registration L9014. I looked it up later. Um, it is a helicopter carrier that has seen action in Libya and Cote d'Ivoire and it's come into Djibouti to refuel and resupply. Um, now it's very odd to see this here in a commercial port and the next day this ship was joined by another ship, um, this time a Chinese warship called the Yan Chang. Um, and it was so strange to see these two big boats from two rival powers in the same port, um, right next to each other. Both are very far from home, both are in the port of another peaceful nation. And both are not always necessarily on the same side when it comes to global geopolitics. Now, stroll a little further along that same promenade, um, and you'll see the presidential palace, and um, then you'll see another port called the Port of Dorale. And now you can see on this graphic um, that our designers at the Mail and Guardian have put together just how this works in terms of the city. Um, at, the, at the bottom right, you've got Camp Le Monnier at the airport, um, and you have four foreign military bases in and around that airport. The French have another military base on the, the Heron Peninsula. There is a US base somewhere that's not marked on here, which, which is an air base used for drones primarily. Um, and then further along the coast, you've got the Chinese base and this Dorile multi-purpose port. Now this port is important. It is a new port and it was built by the Chinese um, who extended very generous credit to Djibouti. Um, now the Chinese are interestingly repeating history. The same way the French needed to build a port to connect to its railway, more than 100 years later, the Chinese are building a port in Djibouti and they are connecting to the railway that is the, the new standard gauge, standard gauge railway that has been built linking Addis Ababa to Djibouti. Um, the railway has been open less than a year and is still a work in progress. Um, trains keep colliding with camels for a start, um, which is really not helping um, it get off the ground. Um, now another thing I'd like to draw your attention to on, on this graphic is the sheer amount of money that Djibouti is generating from um, having these military bases here. Um, the stats that we could find suggest that the US is paying something like $63 million a year, France is paying maybe $36 million a year, China $20 million a year, although other reports say $100 million a year, um, and Italy a few million dollars a year. I couldn't find what Japan is paying. Now this all adds up to a lot of money for a country whose GDP is only $1.7 billion dollars. So you're looking at foreign bases bringing in a good 10% of the GDP and that is just what they're paying in terms of the lease. This does not include whatever other commercial arrangements are at play, whether that's in the form of investment, aid or loans. So I'd like to talk more now about what makes Djibouti so attractive to foreign military powers. Um, of course, we all know about its strategic location. It's on the Red Sea. Um, it's on one of the world's busiest trade routes. Of course, superpowers want to have a presence there. This is especially true after um, the, the sort of piracy epidemic we had a few years ago. Um, and having, it's important to note that having um, these military presences in and around the Horn of Africa have been vital in um, halting the, um, those pirates, as my colleague Timothy Walker may explain later. Um, what also makes Djibouti particularly interesting at this point in time is that Yemen is going through its own conflict. Um, for many years, Aden was of more interest to foreign powers than Djibouti. Um, but these days, Djibouti is considered much more peaceful and stable. And certainly if you look around at the neighborhood, um, you can see why this is the case. There's Yemen to start with, there is um, Eritrea, a sort of dysfunctional state um, up north. To the south is Somalia, um, Somaliland first and then Somalia proper, um, which has its own complications, of course. And then for each foreign power involved, you can also see why they have their, may have their own interests in um, operating in Djibouti. For Japan, um, their presence was very much initiated by the, the piracy threat and wanting to protect their shipping. 
Nowadays, the suspicion is that, that they want to stay there to keep an eye on what the Chinese are doing. Um, for the US, um, the US is in, involved in sort of a, a proxy war in Somalia, and Djibouti is also a, one of the few countries in Africa that will allow the US to have such a large military presence. Um, for China, it's very interesting. China is a new player um, in Djibouti. Um, it opened its military base towards the end of last year, and it seems to be part of a much broader geopolitical strategy um, known by various names, um, but usually as the, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, designed to sort of span the world with a sort of a ring of Chinese military bases and Chinese commercial interests um, designed to facilitate trade. But the main reason that, that Djibouti is, is so important, um, of course, is its stability. Um, the fact that it is considered a peaceful nation, um, it is considered um, to be a place where um, you can do business with the government and you can rely on, on, on what the government is saying and doing. It is, it is relatively dependable and reliable. The president, President Omar Ismail Gele, has been in charge for 19 years and counting. Before that, it was his uncle in charge. So this is very much a family business. Now, that may, may not be a great thing in terms of democracy and respect for rule of law and human rights, but it probably is a good thing if you are a military power looking for a stable place to put your military base. But there are risks to that stability, and that's really what I want to talk about today. There are four main risks that I have been able to outline, and in no particular order, let me take you through them. Number one, um, the entry of China into this particular dynamic. Now, China's presence, as I mentioned earlier, is a little bit different from the rest. Now, you can see that um, the French, the US, the Italians, and even the Japanese are roughly on the same side of most geopolitical conflicts. China, however, um, is generally considered to be a rival power. And it's as yet unclear, given that China has only been there for a very short amount of time, how this is going to play out um, in terms of cooperation between the various militaries. China is also pursuing a much more aggressive trade policy in the region, as evidenced by the railway that it is building. Um, there is also a water pipeline that, that China is financing, linking Ethiopia to Djibouti. Um, it is putting a huge amount of money, more than a billion dollars, into this tiny East African country. And opposition politicians in Djibouti are starting to wonder what is the quid pro quo. And the fear that, that has been expressed is that Djibouti may follow the Sri Lanka model. Um, now, my, another colleague of mine, Ronak Gopal, Gopaldas, wrote a fantastic piece for the Institute for Security Studies looking at the Sri Lankan example in relation to Djibouti. Now, what happened in Sri Lanka is that China advanced a loan to Sri Lanka to build a new port. Once Sri Lanka was unable to keep up with the repayments on that debt, China effectively took control of that port. And in Sri Lanka, this is a big controversy because questions around sovereignty are being asked, you know, is this okay? Um, what can we do about it? Djibouti may be a similar case. Opposition politicians are certainly very worried. They say this is one of the things that keeps them awake at night. They, th they say that there is no way that little Djibouti, with no natural resources to speak of, can possibly keep up with the repayments on all of these huge loans that it is signing on from China. Um, what happens when it cannot repay those loans? Um, is China going to take advantage and possibly seize control of the port? What does that mean for Djibouti's sovereignty? What does that mean for the other military powers in Djibouti? This is a very interesting question. Threat number two to Djibouti's stability. And that is the comp competition over ports in the Horn of Africa. Now, there have been two developments over the last few weeks that are really significant as far as Djibouti is concerned. The first is that Djibouti cancelled a long-term, decades-long contract that it had with Dubai-based company DP World to manage its Dorale container terminal. This is the new port in Dorale, um, which was really going to be its major... Um, 
uh, sort of major avenue for Ethiopian exports. Um, Djibouti has sort of taken back control. They said the contract was entered into illegally and as a result of corruption, and so that is why they are cancelling it. Of course, the United Arab Emirates is um, very unhappy with this, as is DP World. They deny any wrongdoing. Um, and this, the, the, the rumors are that the next, the, the most likely candidate for, to, to, the most likely candidate to take over the running of the port is a Chinese company, and that is feeding into fears over um, Chinese plans in Djibouti. The second development was in Somaliland. Um, now, Somaliland is just south of Djibouti, and this is the little autonomous region of Somalia. They declared independence more than 20 years ago. They run themselves as a completely independent state, although no one else formally recognizes that independence. Um, they have built a port in Berbera which is their port city, and um, they're building a highway that's linking it to Ethiopia. And interestingly, Ethiopia just acquired an 18% stake in the Berber port, um, which is also run by DP World. And apparently part of the problem um, was that DP World were charging lower fees in Berbera than they were in Djibouti, and that is why Djibouti was unhappy. Um, now we're going to see what, what happens here, because this little rivalry, um, along with a, a sort of broader rivalry with East African ports such as Mombasa, the potential new one in Lamu, Dar es Salaam, um, if Djibouti were to lose out in this sort of economic port race, um, this really could have a devastating impact on its economy, and who knows what kind of political instability that may cause. Number three, and I think this is, is potentially a big one, is instability in Ethiopia. Um, there is a major political crisis currently underway in Ethiopia, um, and if that sort of descends further out of control, um, it is inevitable that this is going to impact, impact Djibouti quite significantly. First of all, from a humanitarian perspective, um, there will be a flood of refugees into Djibouti, even though, as one uh, aid worker told me, refugees really don't like coming to Djibouti because it's too hot. Um, <laughs> they'd rather be anywhere else. Um, the other thing is, with that, is, is how much, how reliant Djibouti is on Ethiopia. All of its water, all its fresh water, comes from Ethiopia. All of its electricity comes from Ethiopia. All of its fresh fruit and vegetables come from Ethiopia. Um, so pretty much any disruption of those supply lines is also going to be um, catastrophic for the economy. Finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, is the political situation, the internal political situation in Djibouti. Now the country just had an election. I was there just for the run-up to it. And the, the main opposition parties declined to run in that election because they said that it was not free and fair. The independent electoral commission um, was not independent and there was just no chance of um, having a proper vote. And the way the, the sort of vote rigging was described to me was, was lovely. The opposition said what, what would happen is that the results would come in on the spreadsheet and there'd be column A for the opposition, column B for the government. The government would just, just move the, the titles at the top um, <laughs> so that they got more votes and the opposition less. Um, I'm sure that is not true, but uh, it's a lovely image nonetheless. Um, there really is a sort of dissatisfaction with the government um, from many sections of the society. And if you are in Djibouti and you manage to get out of the sort of downtown area and the Heron Peninsula where the hotels and the restaurants are, and you go to suburbs like Balbala and um, other places sort of around there, and you start to see just how poor the country is. Um, something like, I've got the statistics here. GDP in Djibouti has doubled in the last decade. That is extraordinary. However, 23% of the population still live in extreme poverty. Um, UNICEF data shows that nearly 60% of the population are unemployed. Health and education statistics have moved up, but marginally, you know, two or three percentage points. Um, we're not talking about the doubling that's happening to the GDP. So clearly the money that's coming into Djibouti is not filtering down. Um, I, I went to one area which particularly stayed with me. It's a little bit disconnected from Djibouti city itself, but still sort of in view. And it's very close to the new um, railway term, uh, the railway station that has been built for the new Addis Djibouti Railway. 
And here people are living in sort of mounds of scrap metal, and that is where they are making their homes. Um, and that is where the sort of poorest of Djibouti society lives. No electricity, no water, no basic services, yet there is almost permanently a cordon of police around there because they are so worried that some kind of protest or insurrection might come from this neighborhood. Um, and that to me is, is really worrying when you've got very little human development happening, but the state is spending upwards of 20% of its budget on its security apparatus. Um, there seems like some imbalance there. And that to me was the greatest worry that I took away was that, you know, by coming to Djibouti, a lot of what the foreign militaries are doing is A, they are propping up the regime with a lot of money. Um, and it is allowing itself to, um, you know, reinforce the mechanisms of authoritarianism. And you can see that just, just in the sort of Djibouti police and, and military that, that wander around, the quality of their weapons, the quality of their uniforms, um, they're driving around in, in Humvees. Um, most African militaries do not have access to anywhere near that kind of um, level of technology and, and, and new um, supplies. Um, so that is one factor. The other factor is just by the very nature of having all these guns and soldiers and warships in, t in and out of Djibouti, it creates a very hostile environment for locals who perhaps want to take on the regime. And I think that is something that um, is an area that can change quite quickly. I think that um, foreign powers that have military presences in Djibouti wield an enormous amount of power with the government if it could be used um, perhaps more effectively and from a purely self-interested point of view needs to be used more effectively because any instability in Djibouti is also going to be instability for those military bases themselves.